Well, good evening. This is Pastor Chris. I hope you were in church this weekend for our message at One Church. But in case you weren't, I wanted to live stream this message onto our website, or at least our Facebook page, so you could take a look at it. It was a message that had to do with God's blessing us and how he goes about it. If you allow me to open with prayer, I'll share this message with you tonight. Father, thank you that you are always watching over us and always drawing us closer to a relationship with you. I pray, Father, that you'll let me preach the word tonight in this informal setting and that we'll be blessed by the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in a season where God is blessing our church in just a mighty way, and we're seeing that blessing in our lives as well. And I don't know about you, if you've ever felt like you were in a season where your prayers were being answered, you felt like God was providing and nourishing your life with those things, furnishing those things that you needed. And when I'm in those seasons, I ask, well, what does God expect of me? I mean, is there something that he wants in return or Am I supposed to just receive these goods, that good things that he's giving to me? And I've looked at a verse of scripture in a new way this week. It's in John, John's Gospel, chapter 15. And I'm going to read it to you. It's verses 1, 2, and 4. And I'm reading this so that you can also receive the blessings that God intends to give all those who believe. John 15 starts this way. Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. Verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I see four main points in this that Jesus is trying to get across to us of how he can bless us, the only way he can bless us. And I'd like to unwrap those for you tonight. Number one point is this. God expects, it's his intention, that all of his followers will bear fruit. Now, what exactly is fruit? I told an illustration this uh, yesterday when I shared this message in Sunday morning uh, that uh, before I was a pastor, I was a speaker and I would go around the country to different places. And one one uh, church in particular where I was speaking out of state, they had done the most thoughtful thing. They prepared a, like a gift box for me. And so when I checked into where I was staying, I found this gift bag with chocolates and chocolate covered peanuts and diet sodas and just all these goodies and I mean it was a few things make us feel as welcome as all those really great foods when you're away from home well as it turns out the next year they asked me to return and speak again so what was I thinking as I traveled to this destination this church I thought when I arrive no matter how weary I am from the trip I've got this basket of chocolate and nuts and sodas to look forward to well, sure enough, when I got to my room, there was a gift box for me, only it wasn't full of chocolates. It was a fruit bouquet. And if you've given a fruit bouquet to someone, I'm sure they enjoyed it very much. It's a thoughtful, sweet gift. But when you have your mind on chocolate and nuts and diet soda, fruit doesn't seem that appealing. I thought about that when I... Um, read this verse because when we say, you know, remain in me and uh, I'm the vine, Jesus says, and you're the branches, uh, you, you remain in me, you bear much fruit. We think, you know, fruit, what, what really gives? The fruit that Jesus is talking about and why this is interesting to us is what is good about God, the divine, the, um, the unique God character, uh, his power, his goodness, uh, all, you know, all that he has to give to humanity only flows through him to us when we remain connected to him. And what comes out of our lives is everything that is touched by the divine power of God. That's a whole lot. Let me break that down a little bit. If in my relationships, I relied only on my goodness, my heart, my desires, what I thought was best, 
I might get the answers right and I may do the right things sometimes, but I might get it wrong knowing me most of the time. It's only when I remain in Christ that I'm thinking the thoughts of Christ and doing the things that Christ would have me to do. So those choices I make, behaviors I exhibit, ways I treat the people I love are the fruit of staying connected with Christ. Let me give you another example. If you are in a business and you want to do some in the, something that's uh, innovative, you want to break out of a problem that you're facing, uh, you um, are challenged by something and you're not really sure what to do, well, the only way or any place you really have to turn is to your mind or maybe to periodicals in your industry, someone else for counsel. But when you are remaining in Christ, you ask him for direction and creativity and uh, a breakthrough in your life in those things that matter most to you. When we're in connect connection with Christ, because he's the vine, we're the branches, and this fruit is produced, what pours out of us is the good things of God. And everything God touches in our lives is made better by his presence. And when we're not connected to him, we're only, we are limited to only the things that we create on our own. So Jesus says to us, remain in me. Of course, he's using the, the language of metaphor, that figure of speech, when you want to tell someone about something but concrete language is just lands flat. It doesn't con convey all of the melody and music of what's being said. So Jesus is talking in terms of this, this uh, language of, of gardening. Let me read this verse to you um, from uh, verse four. Remain in me as I remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Do you feel any pressure when you hear that? Uh, we have to remain in him. Uh, if we're a branch that doesn't you know, uh, bear fruit, he, he, he throws us off, throws us away. If we bear fruit, then he, um, he prunes us. That feels like a lot of pressure, doesn't it? I mean, we don't want to be the kind of branch that doesn't produce fruit. But what Jesus is saying here is very liberating to us. The blessings that we want in life come from remaining connected with Christ. He doesn't say, break away from me and go about creating fruit, creating good works on your own. He doesn't say, I'll give you good advice. Then you're on your own to produce good works on your own. He says exactly the opposite. And this is the key to us. If you are a super religious person or not so much, here is the key to blessing in your life. Remain connected with God. Now, how do you do that exactly? How do you remain connected with Christ? Well, if you think about it this way, um, the Bible might say, obey, obey God. If you love me, you'll obey me. In our house, where Krista and I have children, uh, we want them to do the things that we, you know, told them to do because it leads to uh, the house being blessed or the kids, everyone getting along. Uh, but we don't use the word obey. We use the word listen. Are you, are you listening to me? Um, are you being a good listener? We'll use that language. And often in the Bible, we don't use the word listening so much. So we'll use the, Jesus will use the word follow. Are you following me? If we are obeying God, listening to God, and following him, then we are remaining in him. It's interesting to me. The relationship of how we stay connected to Christ is what leads to this production of bearing fruit, the good things in life. And that really is what we want when we talk about God's spiritual dimension in our lives. We want blessing. We're like, God, answer my prayers. Uh, create a solution to my dilemma. Um, change where I'm at. Give me purpose to my life. Make my life have meaning. Um, you know, help me have the things that I want to have in my life that, that make it make sense and be enjoyable to me. All of these things only come out of our connection with Christ. They don't come out of the self-generation or some power that he gives us that allows us to open the doors on our own. It's all um, 
depended upon our rich, not uh, uh, unbreakable connection with Christ. He loves us that much. And I think we feel tremendous pressure to do things for God or to do things on our own when really the secret here is remaining in him. Point number two. First point, God expects people to bear fruit by staying connected to him. Point number two, when people produce fruit, he said branches, but he means people, he prunes those people. Wow, that sounds great. Uh, you will know you're in the pruning process with God when you see bad habits in your life disappearing. You will know you're in the pruning process when you feel tested by the difficulties or challenges that you face. Have you ever felt like you really are living a good life? You feel connected to Christ. You're active in your church life. Uh, you're growing in the Lord. Uh, you have devotional time. You have quiet times of prayer with God. You really feel like you're on top of your spiritual um, life. And yet there are these challenges that you're facing. And you think, why? When I'm following God, or am I facing challenges as well? The answer to that very often can be that God is pruning you in those times. Now, again, metaphor language, what does that mean for the believer? Well, in a gardener parlance, gardeners speak, what a gardener is doing to a fruit tree by pruning it is allowing the branches to create and produce more fruit. The, the gardener is pruning those parts of the branch that are dead or damaged or diseased. Have you ever seen a tree where something has struck the tree and you kind of see it, you know, the, the bark has broken open and the branch is sort of torn off? It's damaged and needs to be removed. Or maybe there's a part of the tree that's dead. Um, I'll often see dead branches on the tree itself um, and in the trees in our yard. Or maybe part of that tree is just diseased and needs to be cut off. Now think about that in your own life. Would you want God to take out of your life those things that are dead, diseased, or damaged so that you would be free of those? God is a liberator in our, life, our lives. We would never choose to be connected to some part of ourselves that was dead, diseased, or damaged. We want him to heal, restore, repair, or remove from us those things that that are bothersome or keep us back from the blessings that he has for us. Jesus says he prunes those. When you are connected to him and your life is producing good works, your life is producing uh, fruit, it's bearing fruit in your relationships, in your life, in the things that are most sacred to you, God begins that careful pruning process in your life so that you can be freed from the limitations that come from those things dead damaged or diseased in you. I was thinking about this uh, Disney story. It started as a fairy tale, Snow White. Everyone's heard of that. Maybe you've seen the Disney version of it. Um, there's a character in the story of the evil queen, and uh, she has a magic mirror she looks into. Do you remember the catchphrase, her memorable movie quote that she says? She'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror will, the mirror will answer back, it's, it's you, queen. Except when Snow White enters the story, the mirror changes its answer. The fairest of them all is Snow White. And when the queen hears this, it reveals something about the character of the queen. I know we're told, talking about a fairy tale here, but follow this. It reveals the queen's Vanity, her envy, her jealousy surfaces, her malice, her hatred. Because if you remember the story, the very next thing that the queen does is she instructs the woodsman, the huntsman, to take Snow White out into the woods and kill her. That's pretty messed up, isn't it? Out of the heart of the evil queen comes murder. And then to bring back the heart of Snow White in a jeweled box. That is so gripping an image to me. Let's talk about the heart for just a minute. Now, if I was a pastor somehow in this fairy tale story, and I were to tell the gospel, the story of God's love for us, to that wicked old queen, 
and she were to come to faith, God would, and she began to bear fruit in her life, don't you think that God would want to go in there into that wicked, old, evil queen's heart and begin to prune away those parts of her, the pieces of her life that would cause that envy and jealousy and hatred and malice so that they would no longer be there. Those parts of the queen's heart that are dead, damaged, or diseased. When we look into ourselves, do we ever see those kinds of characteristics? Maybe not to the degree we see in the evil queen, but we see in ourselves some very dark spaces. And as followers of Christ, we can trust that God will never let those remain in us, no matter how painful he is about the business of pruning those away. Point number three from those verses, our task is that God will, uh, our, our task is to remain in Jesus. And we talked about that a little bit with the listening and following and obeying. I thought about this um, lyrics from a famous uh, Christian hymn. It was written in the 18th century by a man named Charles Wesley. Uh, you may be familiar with with Charles Wesley, you may be familiar with John Wesley, a famous English pastor and evangelist, became the founder of the Methodist um, form of, of Christianity. And he, his brother Charles penned these words, and they talk about the, the place where we are sometimes in the darkness of our lives, and we hear this gospel message. I'll talk about that in a minute. And it changes the trajectory of our life. Let me read this poetry. It's really beautiful. Uh, Charles Wesley says, long, long time, my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, meaning that for a long time he was just in a state of depression. Thine eye, that means his own, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. So in this darkness of his light, of, of his, the night of his depression, this light breaks in, which is the gospel of Christ. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. When we come in contact spiritually with the very goodness of God, our hearts want nothing else. When in our lives, which seem purposeless sometimes, meaningless sometimes, we don't know what to do. We don't even know what the point of it is. We're in a spiritual dungeon, and, there, and, the, and the Bible using metaphor would say, that's like darkness. But this ray of light enters in, and we'll call this in, uh, in, in our faith in churches, the gospel, the good news. Let me just describe this to you for a minute. The gospel is what is good about our lives is what Jesus has done in his death on the cross, not what you're able to produce on your own. It's about Jesus's works, not your works. That's good news because you and I both know we're not that good at being good all the time. Jesus's work, not our works. The gospel is good news about what has been done to save you, not good advice about what you need to do to save yourself. What a relief. Jesus does the work of making us right before God and making us right in our lives. We don't do that work. We remain connected to him to bear much fruit. We are not about the business of making ourselves good enough to satisfy God or good enough even to satisfy our own standards. The gospel is that your relationship with God, your friendship, your connection, your love of him and his love for you is not determined by your past and your record. It is determined by Jesus's past, what he did on the cross, and his record of dying for all the sins of all people. That is good news because it means that God is no longer angry with you about those shortcomings of your life, those seasons of rebellion. And you may be in one of those right now. You may be in one of the lowest points of your life and wonder how God could ever love someone like you. He loves someone like you because he is love. And he made a way to restore the relationship between you and he by the death of his son. 
The blood of Jesus Christ has the power of erasing, eradicating, removing your sin because someone has paid for what you and I have done. God himself. The cross is itself a throne. Point number four, and we're wrapping up. No branch bears fruit on its own. This is fascinating to me. There is there are some things we are responsible for, but in the gospel message I just told you of, it's Christ who does the work. It's you that brings the faith. It's a kind of collaboration, but one, uh, I hesitate to say that because it's so much the work of Christ. Our faith, his work, sal- brings about salvation. Jesus says in this, these verses we're looking at in John 15, verses 1, 2, and 4, and if you have a Bible, look them up. It's absolutely, incredibly interesting that it's only in remaining in him that we bear fruit. Okay, so another version of collaboration with the Lord. We remain with him and good works, uh, uh, fruit, we bear fruit because of this collaboration with him. Now, when Jesus originally spoke these words, he would have taught a crowd of people, but they all heard the words as individuals. Yesterday, when I was sharing this message at one church, and you see the t-shirt back here, when I was sharing the message at one church, I was speaking to a congregation, but they were hearing it as individuals. Tonight, I'm speaking this online, and a group of people are hearing this, but you're all listening to the message as individuals. What is the responsibility of a person as a believer on their own in light of how we operate, function, relate to God. And how much of this, based on these examples, is actually a collaboration that we don't do this life of Christ alone, we don't do salvation alone, we don't bear fruit alone. What part of it is our doing, our responsibility, and what part of it is the greater collective? That's an interesting question. We do best in the company of others. That's what the Bible says. Let me share with you. This is the last verse I've got. We're wrapping up. Hebrews 10 says this. The writer of Hebrews, let us, that's believers, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. Now, does that sound religious to you? Or does that sound like the very thing you want in your life? Love and good deeds done to you, you doing good deeds to others. Let's consider how we can do that, says the writer of Hebrews. Uh, Not giving up meeting together, together, collective, not alone as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I'll talk about that in just a second. The writer of Hebrews is saying, how do we bear fruit and uh, be reminded to spur one another on towards good love and good deeds? It's by joining together and being together. We have this cultural narrative and we're all... um, We're all affected by it, that it's really just, it's me and Jesus, you know? It's really just, I listen to this guy streaming on internet, and that's where I get my religious, you know, my inspiration, a message that I'm encouraged by. But it really is the participation of community where we find ourselves known, and we know other people. People know who we are, and we know them. Trust is formed kind of friendship that the Bible calls koinonia. It's a deeper, committed, covenant friendship, a bond that is long-lasting in this life and in eternity. Uh, it's, it's, um, It's really something that no one can ever get on their own. And even our faith, we think, well, I believe in Jesus. You know, he can stay over in heaven somewhere. I don't even need to see him. I just got this little bottled up faith, and so I'm good. Uh, no, not, not at all. We're, we're saved because of our relationship and faith in Christ. We are bearing fruit, those love and good deeds in our lives because we remain connected with him. And we spur each other on to love and good deeds because we collectively get together in a place called church. This uh, lobby that you see behind me is where we congregate on Saturday nights at 5.30 and Sunday mornings at 10, a group of imperfect people. Uh, we are beggars who have found bread 
and we are sharing the bread with other people. And so if you live in the Clifton Park area and you don't have a church family that know you and, and are friends with you, come join us here. We would absolutely love to uh, enjoy snacks in this room. We always have food around and have coffee or tea and hear a message, hear some awesome music and relate to each other in that spirit of friendship. We want to grow in our faith in Christ. And then we want to take the faith that we have outside these doors so our homes, neighborhoods, jobs um, can be blessed by that fruit that we bear of Christ's presence in our lives. May you be blessed tonight. May God richly bless you in all ways. And I hope to see you this weekend at One Church in Clifton Park. God bless.